This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Chinese President Xi Jinping reviews a year of struggle and achievements. The opening of schools in Zimbabwe is suspended as COVID-19 resurges. And UNICEF warns millions of children are at risk of acute malnutrition in 2021. Hello and a warm welcome to Africa Live on CGTN. I'm Lindim Tongana in Nairobi. And with me is Uche Okorongpo with your business headlines. Thanks, Lindy. And here's a look at what's coming up on Africa Live Bit. Bitcoin is back in full swing, hitting a record high of $28,000. And South Africa's strict nationwide lockdown breathes life into the online sector. Of course, all that coming up within the program. For now, it is back to you, Lindy. Thanks, Richie. Well, here in Kenya, the new year is still a few hours away. China, however, has already bid farewell to 2020, a year like no other. Here's Chinese President Xi Jinping's New Year's message for 2021. President Xi said 2020 was an extraordinary year as the world has been facing the coronavirus pandemic. He praised the Chinese people's contributions to the fight against COVID-19. <laughs> Tianbuba 无数人以生命复使命，用挚爱护苍生。The president talked about China's economic resilience and highlighted the country's major scientific achievements. 我国在世界主要经济体中率先实现正增长。预计2020年国内生产总值迈上。百万亿元新台阶。粮食生产喜获十七连风。天文一号、嫦娥五号、奋斗者号等科学探测实现重大突破。海南自由贸易港建设蓬勃展开。China vowed to eradicate extreme poverty by the end of 2020 and the country announced this had been accomplished. When recalling his visits to poverty-stricken areas, she spoke highly of the efforts made by rural people and the officials in charge, and he reminded everyone further efforts are needed for the goal of common prosperity. In 2021, the Communist Party of China will turn 100. President Xi said the CPC will continue to put people at the center and step up efforts to realize the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Looking forward, President Xi encouraged the Chinese people to strive for a better life and brighter future. Well, let's take a closer look at Xi Jinping's New Year message. I'm joined from Johannesburg by Dr. Emmanuel Matambo, a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of KwaZulu Natal. Uh, Dr. Matambo, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Now, in his speech, President Xi Jinping described 2020 as an extraordinary year, but also commended China's economic resilience and highlighted the country's major scientific achievements. In your view, what lessons can be learned from China this year? 
Thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, good day to your viewers everywhere. Um, yes, indeed, 2020, by any measure, has been an extraordinary year. Both, of course, uh, it has been um, mainly uh, dominated by the coronavirus pandemic. But then there are also sports like China that have showed great resilience, especially in the second, in the third quarter of uh, the Chinese economy, where it grew, I think, by maybe uh, about 4.9% or something like that. So what we can learn, though, from China is that an economy has to be dynamic, especially here in Africa, where, for example, our economies mainly depend on mineral resources and natural resources. China has shown that through digitization, especially, and innovation, you could find ways that could keep you afloat even when your economy hits a turbulence uh, a storm. And that, of course, comes from 2000, about 2013, when President Xi Jinping said China was now entering an era that it called a new normal. It would no longer only depend on, uh, on, on, on labor, especially primary, primary labor. It entered an, uh, an era where growth would not be more as, as frenetic as it was in the, third, in the first 35 years after reforms, but growth would be more sustained and it would be more based on services, and that has been helped to a great deal by digitalizing the economy and, of course, by the Chinese people themselves being so innovative in finding ways of maintaining their impressive economic growth. Mm. Well, well, Dr. Matambo, from uh, trade to diplomacy, it was a year of business unusual. Uh, but in terms of China-Africa cooperation, how would you describe the year 2020? When it comes to China-Africa cooperation, of course, uh, in the year 2020, the, it, it has, as, as you have rightly put it, as, it has not have been business unusual. The coronavirus was politicized by uh, both, especially in the, in the West, for example. There was also a racial dimension that was put into it. And of course, that spilled over in terms of Africa-China relations. But in the general picture, China-Africa relations have weathered this uh, storm. And China, of course, has vowed to help Africa with developing the centers for disease uh, control. So that is uh, a demonstration of just how resilient China-Africa relations are. But of course, we shouldn't gloss over the real uh, issues that could actually sully this uh, long-standing relationship and quite an important relationship, actually. Absolutely. Well, looking ahead then to 2021, what should Africa be looking for in its relationship with China? The year 2021 will be a year of uh, should be a year of great promise for Africa, especially when it comes to uh, economic growth because and, and Africa's integration. Because it will be a year when the long-standing dream of economic integration in Africa will be implemented through the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. So, it is hoped, of course, that China will help in that particular venture by enhancing African potential, especially industrial potential, rather than only bringing things that are ready uh, made uh, elsewhere, because that will actually stunt Africa's industrial potential. So there is great potential for growth, especially through the uh, African continental trade area. And of course, China has to make sure that it also helps to enhance Africa's capacity, scientific capacity, especially to deal with issues such as the Ebola crisis and uh, the coronavirus pandemic, should they arise in the future, because this might not be the last time that such a thing is happening. And of course, the relationship has to be people-centered, uh, as, uh, as President Xi Jinping himself said in his, in his new speech about China. So that also has to be implemented in the way that Africa will interact with China going forward. But there is great potential. There's boundless uh, areas where the economy could be strengthened for the benefit of both parties. Well, indeed, a people-centered approach may very well be the focus for 2021. Thank you so much, Dr. Emmanuel Matambo, joining us there live from Johannesburg. Now turning to other news, the United Nations Children's Fund says over 10 million children will face acute malnutrition in 2021. A new report focuses on five hotspots which are facing humanitarian situations along with food security challenges. The DRC, the Central Sahel and Northwest Nigeria are among those on the list. Burkina Faso has been singled out as one of the hardest hit countries with acute food insecurity increasing by 167 percent. UNICEF is looking to boost its nutrition programs for children affected by humanitarian crises. It is appealing for over $1 billion for 2021. 
Now, health officials in Nigeria say they're carrying out further tests to determine whether or not a new variant of COVID-19 found in the United Kingdom is now present in the West African country. Nigeria has seen a recent spike in infections, and there are fears this might be linked to that recent strain. CGTN's Deji Badmus has more. Nigeria recorded its highest infection rate in a single week to date this past week. Authorities are calling it the country's worst period since the outbreak of the virus. Our TPR analysis shows that 16 out of every 100 tests carried out are positive. We are also seeing increasing transmission among younger people. Our treatment centers are filling up. We're struggling to keep up. We're struggling to find the facilities to manage, the oxygen to manage. Every night we're faced with phone calls of patients desperate for care. Infections began climbing in December, leading authorities to declare a second wave of the pandemic. Health authorities suspect a new variant of the virus detected in the UK could be partly responsible for the recent spike. We suspect that this variant is already in Nigeria. It will be surprising if it is not. But we simply don't know yet. So what we are doing are collecting samples of recently diagnosed cases and working to do the sequencing that needs to do, we need to do in order to verify if this variant exists in Nigeria or not. The government has now placed tighter restrictions on passengers flying into the country from the UK and South Africa which has detected separate variant of the virus. It's also reinstated some of the earlier restrictions it lifted. The other challenge that we're facing, apart from the challenge of the outbreak, is an increasing outbreak of misinformation. Every day we receive broadcast messages on WhatsApp, people sending forth messages that are unsubstantiated and in fact wrong. With the increasing number of infections, the government has ordered the reopening of isolation centers. The commercial capital Lagos is the epicenter of the outbreak in the country. Authorities here are increasing testing capacity and setting up oxygen sample sites for patients with severe cases. An oxygen sample site is a permanent structure and there are 10 of them across Lagos. So if you can't get to one of our isolation centers and you need oxygen, all you need to do is go to one of these centers and you can be managed there. We give you enough oxygen till you calm down. We start some treatment before we transfer you to an isolation center. A COVID-19 vaccine is expected in January. In the meantime, the government is appealing to the public to comply with preventive measures. Deji Badmos, CGTN, Lagos. Nigeria. Zimbabwe's government has postponed indefinitely the reopening of schools for the 2021 academic year. This amid a surge in COVID-19 infections and the threat of tropical storm Chalane, which is expected to cause damage to eastern parts of the country. All learners were scheduled to return to school on January 5th, but now only O and A level examination candidates will be allowed back to finish off sitting their public end of year exams that have spilled over into 2021 due to COVID-19 disruptions. The bulk of the 2020 academic year was written off as schools were closed until November and when they did resume for the final term, some were forced to close again after several students and teachers tested positive for COVID-19. The postponement comes amidst a recent spike in infections and the emergence of new variants of the virus. On December 30th, Zimbabwe recorded 300 new cases, its third highest daily tally since the pandemic broke out. Government's decision has also been influenced by fears over safety as well as the threat of potential damage to infrastructure by tropical storm Charlene, which is currently sweeping through eastern parts of the country. Heavy rains accompanied by huge gusts of wind have reportedly blown the roofs of some houses, cutting off electricity and communication. Several hundreds of villagers in Chimani Mani district have been evacuated to higher ground to escape potential flash flooding and mudslides. Farai Makutuya, CGTN, Harare, Zimbabwe.
Well, time now for a short break. Coming up. We'll be taking a look at some of the major stories in Africa this year, from COVID-19 and conflict to peace efforts and Africa's solutions. Africa is a continent of diversity, with varied climates and enchanting geography, and a people so distinct, but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Adnan Shirishi, Tunis, Juba, Johannesburg, Ethiopia, Tanzania. Africa Live. Find your voice. Well, the COVID-19 pandemic certainly dominated headlines across the world and indeed through Africa in 2020. Governments were forced to introduce uh, strict lockdown measures and the wearing of masks became mandatory in many places. Furthermore, curfews were imposed and social distancing protocols introduced as countries struggled to curb the spread of the virus. CGTN's Robert Nagila looks back at how the pandemic unfolded across the continent. This is the defining global health crisis of our time. By the time the World Health Organization was declaring COVID-19 a global pandemic in March, the first COVID-19 case in Africa had been recorded a month earlier. By the end of March, several African nations had imposed strict measures in an attempt to control the spread of the virus. By then, South Africa had recorded the highest number of cases on the continent. There is sufficient evidence to show that the lockdown is indeed working. As April began, China had donated millions of face masks, test kits and thousands of protective suits to Africa. By the end of May, all African countries had recorded COVID-19 cases, with Lesotho becoming the last country to confirm a case. In June, the first COVID-19 vaccine trials kicked off in South Africa. By mid-July, Egypt and South Africa had the highest number of confirmed cases, accounting for 75% of all new cases reported. In the beginning of August, the number of COVID-19 cases on the continent passed the 1 million mark. As September came to an end, African countries signed up to COVAX, a global initiative aimed at securing at least 220 million doses of the vaccine for the continent. African governments assured their populations of a vaccine safety concerns. Government will ensure that the COVID-19 vaccines to be deployed in the country are effective and are safe. In November, WHO announced the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines would begin in mid-2021. In December, South Africa announced a rise in infections in the country was due to a new strain of COVID-19. In several countries, little or no data on testing made it difficult to get an accurate picture on the spread of the virus. Only 10 countries, among them South Africa, Egypt and Kenya, accounted for 70% of the total tests on the continent. Robert Nagela, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. Well, turning to political events in 2020, in August, Mali's military ousted then-President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita. The ouster followed months of mass protests against corruption, mismanagement of the economy and a dispute over legislative elections. An interim government is now overseeing an 18-month transition period. Cham Gwano takes a closer look at the leadership in place. With a population of 20 million, half of which live below the poverty line, Mali is looking forward to change. It's been four months since Mali's recent coup. The military junta behind the coup have now transferred power to transitional authorities. The country has adopted a roadmap for governance. A national election is now expected after an 18-month transitional period. 
Heading the transition is President Ban Dao, a former defense minister picked by coup leader Kanon Asimi Goita. Goita is now the deputy president, while former foreign affairs minister Mokta Uwane is the prime minister. In Accra, the chair of the authority of heads of system government, the president of Ghana, made it very clear that immediately a civilian prime minister is appointed, uh, sanctions will be lifted. The team is already facing hurdles. The interim government has not met a gender quota required by Malian law. At least 30% of elected or appointed officials must be women. But only four women were appointed to a 25-member cabinet. <laughs> Meanwhile, regional bloc ECOWAS has been a staunch supporter of the return to civilian role. West African bodies said the head of the transitional government will not be allowed to run in the election following the transition period. We have been able to reaffirm the positions of ECOWAS. We need a civilian leadership of the transition. And we've also made it clear that the minute that leadership is put in place through the processes that they themselves have agreed on in Mali, the sanctions that have been placed against, them, against Mali will be lifted by, by, by ECOWAS. Whoever Mali voters choose as their next leader, there will be a lot in their plate. There's the jihadist threat in the north, rampant corruption, a weak economy, and discontent among Malian youth. Chum Hono for CGTN. Well, peace and security proved to be persistent challenges in Africa this year. The African Union dedicated the year 2020 to the theme silencing the guns. But the continental body says more conflicts have erupted and others simply continued despite this call. CGTN's Coletto Wanjoy spoke to the AU about homegrown solutions to conflict and measures towards a peaceful Africa. There are over a dozen major conflicts going on in Africa. Libya, Somalia, South Sudan, Cameroon, Burkina Faso, and the Lake Chad region are just some of the areas of great concern to the continent. The African Union says dialogue remains the best way to resolve such conflicts. Securing the interests and rights of all sections of society. That is the most crucial part. It is not really about uh, the political power uh, of this party or that party. It is about members of society, the interest of members of society. All members of society, in all their diversity, in all their uh, differences. Th that is the most crucial part. If we are able to provide that kind of platform, then I think that is the most, uh, the most viable. The AU says that in many polarized situations in Africa, elections are not always the solution. It adds that if polls are to be successful in addressing such situations, certain conditions need to be in place. What you need to have is basically a situation whereby uh, there is some minimum level of consensus and what you may consider to be political settlement on the fundamentals okay, of how we live together and how we govern and share the responsibility of governing our affairs as a society. Where this is lacking, uh, then election can't fix that. The UN humanitarian agency says over 18 million people in Africa need assistance. Some are refugees, others are internally displaced people, but not because of war. The UN says countries must commit to provide basic needs for their citizens to avoid internal displacement because of lack of resources. When we build refugee camps, you know, within months, we are able to supply water, portable water, to 60,000, 70,000 uh, people. But there are villages on the continent we still struggle to do that, you know. To drill, commission a borehole with solar power will not cost more than $10,000 uh, to service 10,000 people. Uh, so I think there has to be that uh, reflection. Uh, as we at Sierra, we continue to help out, but we are not a solution. And uh, we want that uh, debate to always be on the agenda of uh, the African Union. The COVID-19 pandemic poses a new challenge to conflict resolution with refugees and internally displaced people now more vulnerable. 
African Centers for Diseases Control and Prevention says that implementation of public health measures is key to addressing that. But the AU is still worried that fresh conflicts may slow down the fight against COVID-19. Koleto Anjohi, CGTN, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And turning to the environment, 2020 saw one of the largest oil spills in the world after the Japanese ship MV Wakashio crashed into a coral reef in Mauritius. That tragedy led to one of the worst environmental disasters in the country's history. CGTN's Feifei Liu takes us back to the July 2020 incident. Hi there, everybody. I am Liu Feifei, and I'm a correspondent with CGTN Africa. Today, we are in a beautiful, beautiful endemic forest. In fact, this place is called Ilo Zigret, and it's nothing short of absolutely magical. Uh, the Ilo Zigret in English means the island of egrets, and it's a tiny island off the coast of a tiny island nation called Mauritius. This is a second visit this year for me to Ilo Zigret because unfortunately, in August of this year, the island, together with the nation of Mauritius, suffered its worst environmental disaster ever. When the Japanese freight ship Wakashio, uh, which ran aground back in July, on August 6th, the Wakashio actually started leaking oil. And the Wakashio was actually just about two kilometers downstream from Ila Zigret. And so a lot of the oil and the toxic fumes came onto this island. Let me tell you a little bit more about Ila Zigret and why this place is so special. So this is a tiny island the size of 26 hectares. Uh, for those of you who are not so good with measurements, which I am one of, this is roughly 32 football fields or about 26 rugby fields. So that's how small this island was. And on this island is a tiny microcosm of what Mauritius was like before it was so-called discovered by humans back in the 1700s. So this island had all the native uh, endemic animals and plants, but they all died and people actually tried to settle here. And in fact, I think the British uh, came and they built a fort here. But back in the 1960s, uh, the government actually designated this island as a nature reserve. And soon afterwards, the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation took over and started meticulously restoring the island to its, well, uh, state before it was discovered. So to restore it back to its natural state. And it was doing a fantastic job. It was a nature reserve and they had brought back um, to life from the brink of extinction, a lot of uh, native endemic animals, such as the pink pigeon, which at one point there were only nine left in the whole world. And now they kind of roamed the island. Uh, they had also started conserving the olive white eyes, such a cute little bird, uh, the fody and the Telfair skink. Um, one of the sad things is that the Mauritian tortoises had already gone extinct, but they have brought over here from the Seychelles some Aldabra tortoises who are doing really well here on the island. Anyways, back to the shipwreck. When the shipwreck happened, all the oil spilled out onto the surface of the ocean, about 1,000 tons of it. And the people on the island started getting very, very concerned about the animals and the plants that they've been conserving. So one of the stories that I did at the time was how these nature loving conservationists here on Ila Zagret painstakingly had moved their animals that they could move and also the plants. So they were relocated all over uh, Mauritius so that they would not be affected by the toxic fumes and also they didn't know what the fuel was going to do to the ground. And now on the 7th of December, the island was finally reopened to the public for tours and we just wanted to come back and see how the animals are doing. And on that note, I'll say goodbye for now. Until next time, Liu Feifei for CGTN Africa. And let's now go to Uche for your latest business news. Thanks, Lindy. And coming up on Africa Live Bit. Bitcoin is back in full swing, hitting a record high of $28,000. And South Africa's strict nationwide lockdown breathes life into the online sector.
How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. Africa Live. Find your voice. Let's start off with Bitcoin. It looks set to end this year with a bang surging above $28,000 on Wednesday to a record high. Now, the world's largest cryptocurrency climbed over 40% in December alone, putting it on track for its biggest monthly gain since 2019. Opinion on this latest price surge still remains pretty divided. Some are arguing that cryptocurrencies are now a hedge against dollar weak weakness and inflation risk. Others continue to question its validity as an asset a class given its speculative nature and its volatility. Nevertheless, experts say with its growing institutional presence, we may see increased retail interest in Bitcoin as a form of digital gold. Still, regulatory concerns remain a wider factor for crypto investors globally. Meanwhile, China has successfully contained the COVID-19 pandemic within its borders. The country has also initiated global, a global economic recovery, taking the lead in driving market confidence. Now, South African trade and economics expert Jason Pine praised the country for offering the international community opportunities to expand market share and growth prospects during this challenging period. Pine also commended China's efforts to promote multilateralism. I cannot emphasize more in terms of what an excellent platform China has presented, the global economy. What is China trying to achieve? I think, number one, they try to rid the world of unilateral dominance. They want big countries, they want them to lead by example, developing countries. They need to think big, they need to expand, they need to share responsibility with the aim of global cooperation. Also, challenges. What, do we, what challenges do we face? Economic globalization. We need to get rid of unilateralism, protectionism, and also we need to look at global governance. Extensive consultation, joint contribution, shared benefits, safeguarding of multilateralism aligned to the World Economic Organization open world economy ambitions. Well, let's head to Egypt now, where the central bank says the tourism sector will continue to get a helping hand. That's after the bank granted tourism companies debt repayment holidays and more room to take out operating loans. Now, a grace period for all loans taken out since the pandemic took hold in March. It now expires at the end of December 2021, after having originally been six months. Companies will then begin paying back the loans in January 2022. Here's Yasser Akim with the details. It's been one of the toughest years for the tourism industry worldwide, including Egypt. Income from the travel and hospitality industry in Egypt has not exceeded $3 billion in 2020, down from $12 billion the year before. Hotel occupancy rates are at an average 30%. The central bank has intervened after the pandemic outbreak to support the ailing tourism sector. With the coronavirus pandemic, the central bank took several measures. One is the $6.5 billion emergency fiscal fund. Also, Egyptian banks were ordered to forfeit all interest rates on loans and postpone installment payments on the whole sector, including the employees. A main condition to receive financial support is that the entity does not lay off any of its workers. Low interest rate loans have also been provided for salary payments. According to Sameh Saad, a business owner in the tourism sector, this multi-billion fiscal package came at the right time. I think this will help a lot. It will help because we have a lot of financial burden. It's not only the staff or the financial burden, but the tax, the electricity, many, 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 many issues are there. 
so uh, this this central bank uh, decree it will help us to survive personally i am chairman of an owning company of two hotels and uh, we have hotel in luxor we have hotel in, in cairo actually ashti ashti steigenberger resort in luxor was closed and it opened in middle of september i send every month 1 million pound for the hotel to survive our novotel airport hotel is doing okay better than before but still the losses are very high with the covid-19 still strong and continues to hit the tourism sector the central bank extended the financial support for another year this is very good because the uh, the problem for me now as we see the whole financial uh, and the whole economical situation is very slowing down we depend 75% uh, from our income comes from europe uh, european tourists and europe is hit very badly so even when they cut now the vaccine and and the movement was slow we are expecting that movement will start to be better maybe in october 21 and uh, i need this grace period so i can start paying my debts because i need to survive from now until october Experts have also commended the extended support provided by the CBE. The decision to extend support is 100% correct economically because income from touristic activities accounts for more than 10% of the GDP and its main and the highest source of the hard currency for the state. It's crucial to keep this industry floating during tough times so that dividends would be very high for the country when things go back to normal. Now hope lies on the effectiveness of the different vaccines to reduce the spread of the virus and enable aviation and tourism to resume at pre-COVID levels. Yes, Hakim for CGTN, Cairo. Let's head to Nigeria now. The country has kicked off a housing project for its growing population. It is adding 300,000 homes across the country for low-income earners. Now, Africa's most populous nation has been experiencing a massive housing deficit of more than 17 million units. As CGTN's Kelechi Mekalam reports, the project is one of the keys to the nation's economic sustainability plan. Bank teller John Idoko lives in this self-contained apartment in Kubwa, a suburb in the Nigerian capital, Abuja. He pays an annual rent of $500 from his 3500 but the apartment is barely able to accommodate his family of four. John has not been able to afford an outright home purchase from his savings. Houses are costly. Majority of them are constructed by private developers who are out to make their profits. But his dream of owning a home may soon come true as government is set to launch a housing project for low-income earners. If truly what government is saying, they are going to do it according to what they said, I'm ready to key in with the amount of money I earn monthly. I've keyed into some housing scheme that at the end of the day, I discovered that I cannot afford it. At times, a room and a parlor, they will give you for 15 million, 20 million, as the case may be. Audit firm PricewaterCoopers puts Nigeria's housing deficit at 17 million units, and the country would need to construct 700,000 houses annually for the next 25 years to close the housing gap. Now government is investing in a mass housing program across the nation. The scheme is targeted at constructing 300,000 homes. Our biggest problem in Nigeria is to sustain a program. We believe uh, this initiative uh, will go in long way to solve the economic uh, problems of Nigerians. Because in every economy, most especially now that we have recession around the corner, I think the government is in the right direction. We only want the government to sustain. Among other economic benefits, the project would also create over 1.8 million jobs and encourage local manufacturing. 
at least 90% of the inputs into these houses will be locally manufactured. So here you see the windows, the doors, the paints are all made by Nigerian companies. So some of those manufacturers will now need to go and employ more people to be able to meet the order for a mass housing program. We launched the online portal, which ensures that everybody goes on and log on there and we can trace which house is going to who. With this government housing scheme, it would cost about $5,000 to purchase a home. And the flexible payment schedule makes it very affordable for minimum wage earners. The scheme is accessible to citizens who've never owned a home and have means to repay the mortgage. Kelechi Emekalam, CGT and Abuja, Nigeria. Now, before the hard lockdown in South Africa earlier this year, the online delivery service sector was the preserve of established businesses uh, with national franchises. But when the stringent lockdown rules were eased in the middle of the year to allow businesses with the delivery services to operate, many had to rethink their strategies to remain in business. Well, Angelo Coppola takes a look at how the sector has been booming on grassroots tonight. The result was the rapid adoption of online and e-commerce operations, with new and established players vying for customers. The larger uh, retailers very quickly understood that customers were using their mobile devices to find where to shop, where to get goods, services and food. And therefore the app became a critical element of it. And for smaller retailers, there was a, a very quick dawning of understanding that people were using WhatsApp in particular very actively to try to source information. The change in the way people shopped also encouraged new entrants into the market as the lockdown went into full swing. One fresh fruit and vegetable delivery service opened its online doors in March. We had a very big July, it really picked up in July where there was that people were scared again. And in December it's been relatively quiet because a lot of people aren't home, but we have seen uh, uh, an increase in, in uh, sales in the last two weeks since the second wave and this new variant of COVID has come into the country. Traditional marketing and business development techniques and approaches were turned upside down when the lockdown commenced. A new trend was how differently consumers had responded. Individuals turning to the likes of Facebook and WhatsApp to market their services, using WhatsApp as an ordering tool, but also a marketing tool to those customers that they established a relationship with. So it was fascinating to see how the market evolved rapidly. And it was really in response to where consumers were as opposed to trying to get consumers to come to where they are. However, predicting how consumers will act in the foreseeable future is difficult, as this is mostly uncharted territory. I don't want to even predict it because we're going to be going into winter, March, April, May, and I, I see more people maybe staying home. Either, either we're gonna go back into that extreme, extreme lockdown to try and contain everything, or it's gonna continue as it is where it's almost as though, and I hate to say, people don't care, they've become complacent. Entrepreneurs will find opportunities in the most obscure areas, including the fruit and vegetable home delivery market. And as we move into more lockdown with the COVID virus, more opportunities will present themselves. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Well, that's all for now on Africa Live Biz, but ahead on Global Business Africa, we bring you a special review of business events in 2020 and a look ahead into 2021. Of course, all that coming up top of the hour. For now, it is back to Lindy. Thanks, Luce. Well, let's take a short break. Here's what's still ahead on Africa Live. Coming up, we sample the continent's hopes, expectations and aspirations for 2021. Join us in global business and see Africa through our eyes.
Well, of course, 2020 has been a tough year, but that hasn't stopped Africans from around the continent from setting resolutions and expressing their hopes for 2021. Let's take a look. I think it's going to be a tough year, especially for young people and students as like myself. Uh, we've had a lot of break for the larger part of 2020, a break for, from academic uh, life especially. So I expect that a lot of students will have to rise up from inertia when it comes to the academic life. But beyond that, personally, I'm expecting for myself 2021 to bring me some more cash. Because uh, as a young man, young uh, person who's trying to build a business in, in a place like Ghana, it's been a bit difficult. And coronavirus uh, sort of destroyed things. L'année 2020 a été marqué. The year 2020 was marred around the world by COVID-19, a painful event that shook the world. It shook the world and brought all economies to their knees. This disease has not spared my country, Cote d'Ivoire. I hope that 2021 will be the year of the industrialization and China is a reference in this area. My hope is that a powerful country like China can help us. I don't think there's a better way to describe 2020 other than saying it has literally been surreal and pretty much like a science fiction movie. It's been unreal. I don't think anyone could have imagined that anything like this year would, would happen. And even the best of health care systems as we know it was really bearing the brunt of this virus. And it's really been a year that tested the strength of not only the health system, but of individuals as well. I think it is something that we can overcome and potentially in the future learn to live with. We really need to see good things in 2021. There was a lot of crime in our city. Our government must stamp it out next year. We don't want to see it again. We hope our government will prioritize the improvement of our health care system in 2021. Our leaders should strengthen our health services by building hospitals that meet international standards and schools so that we can have a bright future. The organizers of the Ethiopia Great Run are planning for a unique event in January 2021. How would you create your legend? On the fields, on the tracks, in the arenas of Africa. Were you born to be a player? Could this moment be yours? Sports scene, find 